and welcome to Game Tech. It's been a while since I took a look at some hacks and homebrews for various consoles, so let's do it now. In fact, let's start off with some hacks which modify existing games in one way or another. Here's a cool hack of Super Street Fighter 2 on the Super NES. Quite a few people worked on this from what I gather, but the music was edited and looped by Relic. You'll need an SD2 SNES, now called the FX Pack Pro to run it, or an emulator that supports MSU. First off, it has the soundtrack from the 3DO version of Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. That means each and every piece of music has been replaced with what is some of the best arrangements of music from Street Fighter 2. The music in the 3DO game was very short, and then it would fade out and restart from the beginning. That is lame. But here, the music loops seamlessly like it should, so it never fades out after a minute or so. So in that regard, it's even better than the 3DO music. If you can't seamlessly loop your music these days, why even bother? Anyway, now you can have the cool music from the 3DO and the parallax scrolling from the Super Nintendo. Unfortunately, the game is still quite letterboxed, and the voices still have the reverb dialed up to 13. This hack also changes the color around in an attempt to be more like the arcade. Mostly, it looks pretty good. I've got to say though, that Balrog stage here it looks pretty bad. It's so gray. Lastly, the arcade victory screens have been added, with beaten and bloody opponents instead of the sanitized ones we got in the home editions. Overall, this is a really fun hack, especially because of the music. But the other things definitely do help too. This one is Super Hang-On Enhanced for the Genesis from Pyron. This one aims to make the colors a bit more like the arcade and also enhance the background graphics with some new gradients. Check out the original here. And here's the hacked version of the very same stage. Pretty cool. It also restores the billboards to real advertisings instead of the look-alikes that were originally in the game. Basically, that means the Bridgestone and Marlboro billboards now look correct. I'm glad I'm not the only one who loves Super Hang-On. It's truly an overlooked game. Hey, didn't I just do an episode about overlooked games? Anyway, since it's not outrun, people pass this one by, and they really shouldn't. This is a good hack, but I'd like to see the work continue. If possible, I'd like to see more frames of animation for the scaling objects. Maybe a smoother road and music that's in stereo with better instruments. I'm not sure what all can actually be done here though, but I'd love to see them try. Here's Tower of Sorrow for the Master System from Neo Futurism. Believe it or not, this is a hack of Alex Kidd in Miracle World. <laughs> sure doesn't look like Alex Kidd, does it? Well, it actually is, even though no Alex Kidd graphical assets are still here. Your goal in the game is to navigate and ascend a large tower and avoid the nasty traps in each room. Button 1 jumps and button 2 is attack. That right there makes it feel a whole lot like Alex Kidd. The momentum when landing from a jump also feels like Alex. That said, you do get used to it as you're required to do some tricky platforming here and there. You have unlimited lives, at least in the easy version of the game. There's also a hard version. You're able to visit shops and buy a few things that can help you out, like weapons that can shoot further. But if you die, you can say goodbye to those. And trust me, you will die. The graphics are simplified and dark, yet bloody with lots of deadly objects everywhere. The sound has the same type of effects as Alex Kidd, though the music is new. This one will also be getting a physical release sometime in the future. Overall, this is a pretty fun Death Tower game. This is a good one to try if you want to see how far from the source material a hack can get. And plus, it's a hack for the Master System, a console that definitely doesn't get as much love as it should. Do you 
ever wish your Super Nintendo had blast processing? Of course you do, what Super Nintendo owner doesn't? Well, some cool hacks from VTOR enable just that in a few different games on the platform. These take advantage of the SA1 chip. This was an add-on chip used in several games like Super Mario RPG and Kirby's Dream Land 3. The SA1 is very similar to the Super Nintendo's main CPU, but it runs at over 10 MHz instead of 3.58 MHz. A few games have been adapted to take advantage of this. You'll need an FX Pack Pro to run these on real hardware or a donor cartridge with an SA1 chip. The first game to get this fix was Super Mario World. I'm not sure why this game was chosen, but it does get rid of a few minor slowdowns here and there. The most notable being the circle that collapses when the level ends. Neat, I guess. The next was Gradius 3. Gradius 3, I don't know, who cares? This game is hard, but it's beatable. But it's a whole new game when there's absolutely no slowdown at all. Man, this is a super tough game that will keep you on your toes. Look at this nonsense. Ouch. I should have been paying more attention to what I was doing instead of the lack of slowdown. It really takes a bit to get used to this game moving this fast to get anywhere. Pretty damned impressive if I do say so myself. After that, Contra 3 was adapted. This gets rid of some of the minor slowdowns like when you use your bomb and a few other places. Overall, the experience feels a bit smoother. Playing on hard though means it's even tougher. You'll have very little to no time to react especially in this overhead level where you need to be quick in order to get these guys to come out of their little hidey holes in order to shoot them. Bastards. Super Castlevania 4 could probably benefit from this too, right? Well, it doesn't have an SA1 hack yet, but VTOR has changed the game from a low ROM to a high ROM. You see, games that use low ROM run 33% slower than the Super Nintendo's full CPU speed of a blazing 3.58 megahertz. Most early games on the console used low ROM. Developers did this because they hated you. Of course, I'm kidding. It was probably a money reason like most things are. Moving this game over to a high ROM allows it to run at the full power of the system. As you can see, many of the slowdowns are gone. It's especially refreshing to play through this stage now. Wow, it feels a lot better. The toughest parts of the game for the CPU still have a bit of slowdown, but it's definitely better overall. Super Ghouls and Ghosts also got a similar speed boost. There is a hack from SCD, Rain, Poncho, and Khan that removes a lot of the slowdown. It also restores the crucifixes and whatnot that were removed from the Japanese version. Again, there's still some slowdown in here, but overall it's much better. This is Chrono Trigger Crimson Echoes on the Super Nintendo from Kajar Laboratories. Kajar? Kajar? I don't know. This is a huge hack of the original Chrono Trigger game that adds a new story that takes place between the first game and Chrono Cross. In fact, this hack takes the original 32 meg game all the way up to 48 megs. A lot of people worked on this one to bring a good story and lots of new characters and places to enjoy. As you go through the game, you'll of course be familiar with the various Chrono Trigger artwork and music, but like I said, there's some new stuff here too. Right off the bat, Chrono and his super friends get zapped around time and you find yourself in control of Magus. The main problem with this hack is that Square Enix sent them a cease and desist letter before it was complete. However, some non-finalized builds were leaked. As a result, you can encounter some issues in some parts of the game ranging from minor to major. Still, if you're itching for more Chrono Trigger story and gameplay that was created by a lot of fans, well, then you might want to check this one out, if you can find it. No, I won't tell you how and where to get it, and that goes with every other hack and homebrew in this episode as well. Now onto the homebrew section of the episode, and homebrews are basically created from the ground up. Now, I'm not gonna include any games that got a physical release, like, for example, Xeno Crisis, because I wanna save those for a future new games for old consoles episode, whenever I get around to doing that. I don't think any of these games I'm gonna mention here are have a chance in hell of getting released physically, but they still deserve a little love.
Let's check out Sonic Z Dream for the Saturn from XL2. Get it? The Sonic game that was supposed to be on the Saturn back in the day was called Sonic X Dream, and this is Z Dream. Or Z Dream if you play the PAL version, which is also available. Anyway, this is built fresh from the ground up and only inspired by the game that Sega was working on. The Saturn doesn't see much homebrew love at all, so the fact that this even exists is pretty exciting. That said, it's a lot better than I expected it to be as well. You control Sonic and you make your way around levels looking for the exit. You can not only jump, but double jump as well. You can press the Y button to initiate a spin dash, but the way this works is kinda janky. You don't really need it much anyway. You can rotate the camera 90 degrees with the press of the L or the R button. Of course, they are the exact opposite of what I'm used to. For example, pressing L will rotate to Sonic's right. I mean, why? Along the way, you can kill some of these enemies if you want. Or you can collect rings. Like a normal Sonic game, the rings can protect you if you touch something bad, but that's all they really seem to be here for. The gameplay has none of that fast running speed that typical Sonic games are known for, but I still found it fun platforming my way through these levels. The levels themselves can be very strange, and you'll be looking everywhere for hidden passages in order to get to the exit. At first, as you're getting used to the controls, you're probably going to be falling off a lot as every level seems to be floating thousands of feet in the air. That's just how this world works, I guess. There's even a two-player split-screen mode, which I've got to say is pretty damned impressive for a homebrew. In the option screen, you can toggle your target frame rate. The 60 frames per second mode is definitely smoother, but the frame rate is dynamic. As a result, playing in this mode makes the game feel like it has more slowdown than it actually does. I'm not a big fan of variable frame rate, so I keep this one on 30 frames per second and it's mostly fine this way. There's also the pseudo fisheye mode. This isn't actually the curved fisheye from the Sonic Extreme game, but the field of view is much wider here. You can also turn the real-time lighting on or off. The graphics are really good, all things considered. They run smoothly, though there is some texture warping here and there. Of course, there's pop-up or pop-out or pop-in or whatever you want to call it, especially when you rotate the camera standing next to some walls. You also can't see super far into the distance as things will fade in as you get closer. But the cool thing is, is that they fade in with transparency, kind of like Sonic R. But the fact that a homebrew Saturn game is running in 3D is pretty awesome. There's even music, though some of it seems to be from the Japanese version of Sonic CD. That's fine. You can always use your own WAV files before you burn the disc or whatever, just as long as the Q file is looking for the proper track names. I had a lot more fun with this homebrew than I thought I would, and I hope to see more in the future. Project Z Dream from Vasectomy Software is another Saturn homebrew that uses an enhanced version of the same engine. This 2019 demo is more like Power Slave. You're on a first person adventure to give each man a vasectomy in any level you happen to be in. Actually, I'm kidding, your mission is to murder them instead. As you can see, the enemy characters and some of the items have a weird glitchiness to their graphical representations, at least on real hardware here. Kind of annoying, but other than that, this is another homebrew game that really kind of blows me away with what it's doing. Some of the levels seem to be inspired by the likes of Doom and Quake. You can grab a few different weapons which have limited ammo, but you can always use your sword at any time. This will help you perform your vasectomies, sorry, I mean murders. You usually don't need to look up or down, but you can if you want. You can not only jump, but double jump as well. Aside from the glitchy ass enemies, the graphics are great for the system. The textures are pretty good too. You have Goroud, Gorod, shading and lighting everywhere. I don't know how to pronounce that word. And honestly, I don't care because I never plan on saying it again, hopefully. Now watch, I'll have to, several times in the future, I bet. The frame rate is kind of all over the place, which is to be expected, but usually is pretty smooth. This one doesn't come with any music, but you can always add your own WAV files just as long as they're named properly. Otherwise, this demo does quite a bit for less than 10 megabytes uncompressed. You can even use the analog pad if you want. I'm very happy to see something so ambitious from the Saturn homebrew community.
Okay, this is New Super Mario Land for the Super NES from... Well, the creator wishes to remain anonymous. Judging from Nintendo's past actions protecting their IPs, I kinda don't blame him or her. This isn't just a simple port of the Game Boy's Super Mario Land to the Super NES. They upgraded everything to make it seem at home on the more powerful hardware. They also wanted to give it a feeling that's similar to the new Super Mario games that are on the Wii and Wii U and whatnot. So it's basically a combination of the Game Boy game, the newer games, and the Super Nintendo itself. Obviously this isn't a hack, it's built from the ground up and honestly it's not often that you see a lot of homebrew for this console, especially of this caliber. While I enjoyed the original on the Game Boy, I haven't played it enough to memorize the levels or anything, but it all seems to be represented quite well here. The music is still excellent and is some of my favorite music in the entire Mario franchise. Forgive my crappy SCART cable as it has a really extreme buzz for some reason. Anyway, this game is even multiplayer. Up to four players can play at the same time, just like the new Super Mario line of games. This is pretty badass if you ask me. As you can see, the graphics have that pre-rendered look that a lot of games late in the console's life had. To do this, they used Blender to create their own 3D models and then digitize them into the game. That's dedication. I figured that they would just rip the frames from one of the new Super Mario games. Nope. What they did rip, though, was a lot of Mario sounds, as it's clearly Charles Martinet's voice. Control-wise, it can be a bit slippery sometimes, but that's pretty much the case with most 2D Mario games. This is a great gift to fans of the franchise, and I'm blown away by how it turned out. Be absolutely sure to play this one if you can. Okay, let's finish this show up with some more hacks that I found interesting. And these all happen to be for Sega consoles, so if you don't like that, you can just go crying to your pillow. For everyone else, check this crazy stuff out. Here's a hack of Dracula X Nocturne in the Moonlight on the Saturn from YZB. This, of course, is the Japanese version of Castlevania Symphony of the Night. This hack uses the 4 megabyte expansion cartridge to enhance the game, or so they say. It doesn't make the game run any better, at least not that I can notice while playing the normal version and this version back to back. There's still a ton of slowdown during gameplay. The loading times on the hack are a bit faster, by about an average of 3 to 5 frames, so basically nothing. Granted, I'm playing this using a mode optical disc replacement thingy, so that may negate any loading performance improvements. One improvement that they did make was the ability to access the map without having to go through the menu. This is a lifesaver and a great quality of life improvement, but I don't think this is a result of the 4 megabyte cartridge. By the way, I've heard it said that you can't use Sega's official cartridge for some reason, only the likes of an action replay. I don't know why. But I tried both and it seems to work fine with the real cart. A more interesting 4 megabyte Saturn hack is the King of Fighters 95. YZB has done several of these types of hacks. Originally, this game used a dedicated ROM cartridge that contained background graphics or some such data that filled up about 3 megabytes. This allowed the characters to have a bit more animation. This hack has that information on the disc and then loads it into the RAM cartridge during the boot sequence. After that, the game runs as it always did. So the good news is, is that you don't have to have that proprietary cartridge that was tied to this one game anymore. Same goes for Ultraman on the Saturn here, which had its own proprietary cartridge. Unfortunately, this game doesn't currently work on real hardware as it crashes after this FMV scene ends. It won't even get past this now loading screen if you use a real Sega 4 megabyte cartridge. Eh, I hear the game sucks anyway. Up next is the King of Fighters 96, again on the Saturn. This game normally requires a 1 megabyte RAM cartridge, but it's been hacked to take advantage of the 4 meg cart. I'll be honest and say I don't really notice much, if any, difference compared to playing it with a 1 megabyte cartridge. They couldn't add any animation or anything. The only thing that it might do is speed up the loading times a hair. Oh, and you have to use the real Sega cartridge on this one, or you get this. 
This game, as well as a couple of other SNK games on the Saturn, hate the Action Replay 4-in-1 carts. For some reason, they just scramble the graphics. The older Action Replay seem to handle this issue better, though. Lastly, Samurai Spirits RPG has also been given the 4 megabyte treatment. Obviously, this one is still completely in Japanese, and I really haven't played it much. I can't say what's been improved here, if anything even has as a result, but they did make the game easier by giving you three times the amount of money and experience after each battle. There's also a debug screen that pops up if you press the start button. At the end of the day, I'm not convinced that hacking a game to use a 4 megabyte RAM cartridge does anything significant, with the exception of the games that require the ROM card otherwise. Go, puppy! There are probably more hacks of Sonic games than there are grains of sand in the world. But the Sonic 1 hack that I want to talk about is called Sonic The Next Level from Marky Jester. Why this one instead of one of the billions of others? Because this one actually stands out among the crowd. I mean, just listen to the quality of the music. This isn't one of those hacks where they added a CD soundtrack where you need a Mega SD, Mega Everdrive Pro, or a CD unit attached. This will run on any Genesis flash cart, and it uses a Genesis's own sound hardware to recreate everything you hear here. The ROM is 32 megabits, which is even smaller than Super Street Fighter 2 on the same system. This is what the Genesis can sound like, folks, and it's pretty impressive, all things considered. Unfortunately, as a result, there are only three levels to play through in this one. And you know what? I'm totally fine with that. After three or so levels, I've usually had my fill of Sonic gameplay, so this is perfect. The stages are kind of weird, each with their own unique gimmick. On stage one, there are these anti-gravity switches which make Sonic jump really high and far, but it also feels like they turn the CPU down to a quarter of a megahertz. Maybe it's a blast processing on and off switch. In stage two, you can ride these little floaty carts in some places to get around. In stage 3, there are pipes that you need to roll through in order to get to the end of the stage. After that, the screen starts to get all squiggly and reminds me of demo scene stuff as it slowly transitions to the only boss in the game. This boss takes forever, and the control doesn't feel so hot here, with extreme slowdown affecting you as the boss moves around. Sometimes you even get hit by striking his vulnerable point, and there's just so much slowdown here that it makes it difficult to recover any rings. If you die after hitting him 20 or 30 times, yeah, he takes a lot of hits. You just want to turn the game off because you don't want to start over from the beginning fighting the slowdown, especially since you have to sit through his entire intro again. I swear, I've beaten him before though, and that's it. That's the end of the game, which is fine. The stages are sparsely populated with enemies, but there are enough here to make it a slight challenge unless you've been through this a couple of times before. The graphics are pretty good and feature some clever parallax, but you'll encounter some jerky scrolling here and there. Still, I can't believe that this music is coming from my Genesis's sound chip. I absolutely appreciate the effort that was put into this hack. Except for that boss. There are a lot of Streets of Rage 2 hacks as well, and I found this one to be pretty fun. It's called Streets of Rage 2 with Final Fight from Da Lao Hu. On the surface, it looks like a simple sprite hack, but it's a little deeper than that. The characters of Final Fight find themselves in the Streets of Rage universe and vow to clean up the streets while they're here. You can choose from four famous Final Fight characters. Hagger, who is a wrestler and moves kind of slow. He replaces Max from the unhacked game. Cody, of course, replaces Axel as the generic guy. Guy replaces Blaze, and Chun-Li replaces Skate. That's right, Chun-Li is a famous Final Fight character. See, there she is right here in Final Fight 2. Playing with Hagger is kind of rough, because although he has some cool moves, he doesn't seem to be able to pile drive anyone in this game. Cody is pretty generic, and it's not a whole lot different than playing as Axel, who is also generic. Playing as Guy is super fun. 
I love all of the moves that you can do and he moves super fast. Playing as Chun-Li is also really fun. The graphics seem to have less color than normal Streets of Rage 2. The sounds are mostly the same, but there are a few new samples here, like Chun-Li's voice. The music is also the same, but a couple of tunes have been moved for whatever reason. This isn't a deep hack, but it's a fun one to mess around with for an hour. There's also a hack of Streets of Rage 2, which inserts all four Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from Car... or Hero Turtles in Europe, where they prefer their heroes to be heroes and not dumb old ninjas like originally intended. Ninjas are just way too violent for Europe. They are not ready for that. This is mostly a quick and dirty hack from what I can tell, as they didn't even bother to change the story or the title screen. Still, this can be pretty fun. Each turtle has his own moves and control. For example, Donatello can't run. There's also some very quiet, low-quality turtle voices here and there. Also, I think that it's cool that not only do you have your typical score from the normal game, but the number of enemies killed for each player, just like a Turtles arcade beat-em-up. You can't use dropped weapons in this game, even though you can pick them up. If you do, and then you get hit, the weapon just magically reappears right back where you originally picked it up, which is kind of funny. I like the final fight hack better, but this one is still worth a try. There you go, more hacks and homebrews. It's always really interesting to see what the community comes up with. And I know I've probably missed a ton of great stuff. So tell me, what are some hacks and homebrews I should check out? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Games like Super Adventure Island on the Super Nintendo are lots of fun, but there are just so many kids in the world who can't afford games like this, or even the console to play these games on. Truth be told, they probably can't even afford food. They are absolutely starving. So how am I going to enjoy a game like this knowing that these problems exist? Fortunately, these days, the solution is very simple. Ignore it! Doesn't matter if I enjoy this game or not, their problems are still gonna exist. Just because they're not having any fun doesn't mean that I can't have any. Mmm! Cinnamon Punk Crunch is so good! Mmm! So cinnamony, so toasty, and oh, so crunchy! Those starving kids should eat more of this, then they wouldn't be starving. Oh, I got the boomerang. Cinnamon Toast Crunch, the breakfast of a true gamer.